Hold on to your seats. Open your hearts. Let God speak to you because this word could transform your life today and give you a new beginning, particularly for some of you who have been struggling with some stuff. So let's put our hands together for Pastor Ray as he comes to share God's word with us. Well, good morning. Greetings from Murray Bridge. It's uh, wonderful to be back home here again and catch up with uh, old friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's always delightful uh, to come back and see you all and to see some new phases as well. It's wonderful. As a child and as a teen, I was very emotionally and mentally troubled. Didn't understand the reason why. I didn't understand why I felt bad and worthless and guilty. But I was experiencing a lot of emotional pain and that drove me to alcohol, to dangerous life-threatening driving. And eventually that pain drove me to Jesus Christ. I received Christ through my workmate, David Hersey who's one of the board members here, of course. And uh, David prayed for me <clears throat> and shared Christ with me and invited me to church. And on finding Christ, I found a whole new life. I found love. I found hope. I found meaning. I discovered that in God's sight, I was loved, special, valuable, unique. But I went on to discover that Although I thought that I would have no more problems after becoming a Christian, that I actually was very, very scarred and was still mentally quite unbalanced. And so I cried out to God one day after I was a Christian for some months and I just said, God, what is wrong with me? You know, what? Why am I like this? And I just cried out. And then God brought all these memories back to my mind of when I was uh, seven years old and uh, was sexually abused. And uh, I discovered the cause of my mental torment and trauma was that uh, the cause of my guilt, the cause of my unworthiness uh, was uh, that sexual abuse, that false guilt. And my scarring caused me to reject, resist intimacy with all women, including my wife, my own daughter, until I experienced healing at the age of 50. So it's only uh, 16 years ago that uh, I discovered. Or is it 17 years? My goodness, am I really 67? That's hard to believe, isn't it? Man, I'm trying to keep to 66 and, oh well. But at 50 years of age, I experienced healing from my scarring. So scarred is the best description of how many people find themselves, emotionally, mentally and socially scarred. And unless identified, acknowledged and healed, scarring persists throughout a lifetime. Even after becoming a Christian, even after becoming a born-again, new creation in Christ, Christian. This scarring causes various degrees of dysfunction. And as mentioned, scarring damages intimacy and so deeply affects people relationally and socially. So how can those emotional scars be healed? Emotional scars are the memories of the past and many times they're subconscious memories. We think that uh, because we don't have a memory of something happening to us that it never happened. Uh, but many times they're buried. And so the, <clears throat> are the memories from our past that still cause us pain and uh, cause us subconscious negative behaviours in our lives. What sort of memories? Memories of abandonment, memories of abuse, memories of ridicule, criticism, hatred, prejudice that have torn us down. And then there's physical abuse and spiritual abuse, sexual abuse. And 
the sad truth is almost everybody has an emotional wound, a hidden wound. Now some of us mask it, others have it buried deep in the subconscious mind, but it's buried, but it's buried alive. And many times under pressure, <coughs> it raises its ugly head. Many times in a life crisis, the memories come flooding back and we suddenly realise that things have happened to us that we never knew happened to us. But the good news is this, Jesus Christ wants to heal our hidden scars. In fact, I don't know anyone else who can heal hidden scars, who can heal wounds, emotional wounds like Jesus can. Psalm 147, we read, God heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. However, there are some steps that have to be taken for the healing of emotional scars. And uh, those steps are to reveal your hurt and to release those who have hurt you and so on. Number one, the first, reveal your hurt. Psalm 39, verses 2 and 3. I kept very quiet, but I became even more upset. I became very angry inside, and as I thought about it, my anger burned. So here God says that holding on to hurts is like carrying hot coals in your heart, and you're the one that's going to get burned. Grudges, guilts, griefs of the past when they're stuffed down, when they are ignored, they don't heal, rather they fester. And I hid everything. I held it down. And why did I do that? Because I was ashamed. I felt guilty. I felt ashamed. So shame prevented me from seeking help. Psalm, 20, Psalm 32 verse 3. When I kept things to myself, I felt weak deep inside me and I moaned all day long. And even after I came to Christ, there was like a moaning and a groaning within me. I was just worn down by the guilt, by the sense of unworthiness, by the anger. I hated my dad. I hated the abuser. You know, some people just try to forget it. They try to respond to abuse by saying, I'll just put it out of sight, out of mind, I'll stuff it down. Other people try to run from it. And they try many ways to escape. Get drunk like me, do drugs, go to bed with other people they don't even know, get involved in work, become workaholics. Other people try to take their pain out on others and hurting people so often hurt people. Some people just try to cover it up, but none of these ways work. So step one is to be honest about your pain, about your fear, about your anger, about your resentment and about your bitterness over what people did to you. So first of all you have to be honest with yourself. I am ashamed of this, I still hurt, I, I, you know, I'm angry, I, I'm bitter, it's being honest. Number two, you've got to be honest to God. God, this is how I feel. God, I feel angry. God, I hate that person that did this to me. God, why did you let this happen to me? And they were my cries. God, how could you let this happen to me? Why did you allow this? So God can handle that. Third, be honest with a person you trust and there are counsellors here that you can share with in a trusted situation but you need to get it out, get it off because you never get well until you reveal your hurts. So, reveal. Number two, release. Release those who have hurt you. You can't get well and hold on to resentment. So for your own sake, you have to let go of the right to get even. See, getting even won't take away your pain. There's only one way to get rid of hurt in your heart when somebody's hurt you, and that is forgiveness. And you may say to me this morning, but they don't deserve to be given. 
are forgiven. Look what they did to me. Why should they be forgiven? They don't deserve it. And you are right. The man who abused me does not deserve to be forgiven. Truth is, he deserves to burn in hell for a thousand years. But the truth is, so do I. See, in my hurt, I hurt others. In my pain, I took it out on others. But yet God forgave me. So I'm not saying forgive them because they deserve it. I'm saying forgive them so your emotional scar can be healed. Because you can't get on with your life as long as you're stuck in the past. You know, the name of my abuser was Wally. And I discovered that I had to forgive Wally and pray for him to find, really, to find Christ's forgiveness. I wanted him to find Christ's forgiveness like I'd found forgiveness. And I came to the place where I said, Father, I just thank you that you've forgiven me. I've lived a life that has been very bitter, angry, selfish, hateful. I've hurt people. I've stolen from people. I've broken into people's homes and damaged them in ripping out electrical items and piping and, you know, not cared a thing about it. I've done a lot of wicked things. And you've forgiven me. And so, God, I'm asking you to save Wally. I'm asking you to forgive him, save him, transform him like you've transformed me. Because, God, I wouldn't wish hell on a dog, let alone a precious human being. He needs you. He's hurting. He's a sick man. And I was a sick man. And you've, you've saved me and healed me. So you can't hold on to hurt and enjoy life. You've got to let it go. You've got to give up your right to get even. Not because they deserve it, but because you need to be able to get on with your life. Let's read Romans 12, verses 17 to 19. <coughs> Excuse me. Never pay back evil for evil. Never avenge yourself. Leave that to God. For he has said he will repay those that deserve it. So here we read, it's not up to you to settle the score. It's not your duty. God says, I will settle the score. So let Jesus settle the score. So either you can spend the rest of your life, your time, your emotional energy trying to do it, or you can let God do it. Psalm 56 verse 8. You, God, have kept a record of all my tears. Do you know that God has kept a record of every one of your tears? And when you were hurt, God was there and he was hurting. He was in great pain because those who hurt the most are those who love the most. And the person who loves you more than anyone else is God. And he tells you how much he loves you by recording in his word that he has kept a record of all of your tears, every one of them. That demonstrates to us that he really cares and that it is up to him. He, he will bring justice. So he's going to settle the score one day because he is a God of justice. Nothing has ever slipped his watchful eye. And the other thing we need to remember is that Jesus understands abuse. Jesus is God in human flesh. God the Son come to earth in a baby called Jesus. And so he ex has experienced what we have experienced. And he was severely abused. And we need to do what Jesus did when he was abused. Let's read 1 Peter 2 verse 23. When Jesus suffered, he did not threaten to get even. He left his case in the hands of Father God. Now Jesus had all power. Jesus was God, God in human flesh. And we read that he could have called down 10,000 angels. And angels are huge, angels are mighty. He could have come and sent his angels and destroyed them. 
but instead he stretched out his hands and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So why? Why should you forgive those who hurt you? Let's read Hebrews 12 verse 15. A bitter spirit is not only bad in itself, but can also poison the lives of many others. See, resentment and bitterness and hatred poisons everybody around you. When you get bitter, you hurt all kinds of other innocent people and you perpetuate the pain. Because if you don't release the person who's hurt you and offended you, you're going to end up resembling them. You see, we become like the thing we hate. We become like the person we hate. We become poisoned by hate. And then we poison those around about us and end up destroying them as well. Then thirdly, replace the old tapes, the old thinking tapes, with God's truths. You know, our brains are like tape recorders. Our brain has recorded every single experience of our five senses. Everything you've smelled, everything you've seen, everything you've heard, everything you've touched, tasted, it's all in there. You may not be able to recall it, but it's there. The doctors and specialists discovered that when they put uh, probes and touched deep areas of the brain, people could remember things from when they were just babies. They could remember experiences that they had no conscious memory of, but it was all recorded there. And uh, these doctors, these specialists, were able to uh, put the probe in a certain place in the brain and all these memories, even smells, would come flooding back. It's all there. So everything people have said, good and bad, right and wrong, true and false. But here's the problem. Your brain doesn't distinguish between things that are true and things that are false. Particularly when you were a kid. There were some things that were said to you that were flat out lies, but because you're a kid, you believe them. But the problem is that they're buried and we carry them on into our adult lives and we still believe those lies. And then you start living according to those lies. You act on them, you live them out. My dad discovered that Wally had abused me. Uh, someone had witnessed the abuse and instead of rescuing me, they reported the abuse to my dad. And instead of firing Wally, who was an employee, he thrashed me with his belt. I was seven years old. See, I believed it was my fault. Wally wasn't sacked. There was no punishment for Wally, but I was beaten. And so that caused me to believe I was the bad one. I was the guilty one. It was all my fault. And as a result, that guilt and sense of worthlessness uh, drove me to want a suicide. Had a death wish. Had 16 car accidents before I was 21, before I came to Christ. Because I didn't want to live. At about age 19, I loaded my rifle, put it to my head, and uh, began to squeeze the trigger. And I actually heard a voice say to me, don't do that. You belong to me. You belong to me. You're mine. And um, I put the rifle away. You know, some adults are still operating on faulty data received when only children. And you know, when you base your life on faulty data, what happens is you build a self-defeating lifestyle. You're set up for failure and pain and hurt. And so some of you, when you were kids, had adults or authority figures in your life say things like, oh, you're stupid, you're ugly, you're a no-hoper, you're so unco, what sort of idiot are you? You know, I'm embarrassed to call you my child. You're, you're just so dumb why can't you be smart like your brother or your sister you're just worthless and 
those statements went into the recorder of your mind and now some of you are 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years of age and you're still acting on the old tapes because you've believed a lie. So do you wonder why you still feel defeated in some areas of your life? You need to replace those tapes with God's truths. How did that happen for me? It took a long time, 50 years of age, pastor. My wife went to a healing seminar and when she came home I said to her, show me how you do this, take me through it, show me so I can learn how to help people get healed. So we drove down to the river uh, and uh, a place called Avoca Dell and a uh, lovely park there and and we sat in the car and Robin took me through this prayer healing process and she came to this point where she said, now I want you to think of the most painful experience in your life. And I said, oh, the most painful experience in my life without a doubt is when I got sexually abused and then I got beaten for it. And... Um, Then she said, well now I want you to ask Jesus in prayer to tell you what you said when you were seven years of age. And I thought, oh, probably nothing will happen but I'll give it a go. And so I pray, Jesus, tell me what I said to myself when I was seven years of age when I got abused and beaten by my dad and I thought that Jesus would tell me that I said something like I hate my dad for not protecting me I hate my dad for blaming me I hate my dad and I'll never forgive him for not sacking Wally and I got abused a second time but it was none of those I was absolutely shocked and amazed at what Jesus told me. And I was instantly healed from a lie that had prevented me from enjoying intimacy from my wife and from my daughter. I was unable to enjoy hugs and kisses. I felt repulsed. Whenever my wife would hug me, whenever my daughter would hug me, I would make out because I knew they would be so hurt. I couldn't even hug my daughter, by the way. But with my wife, I felt repulsed. I wanted to push her away and she could sense it. And she would say to me, do you really love me? And I'd say, of course I do. I wouldn't be here if I didn't. But inside, I couldn't tell the truth. I knew that if I said, no, I don't. I don't feel love for you. I don't. I feel repulsed by this affection that she, she just wouldn't be able to handle it. Anyway, so I hear this voice and it just sounded like my voice in my head, but it was Jesus. And he said, you said, I will never love or trust a woman again because women leave you. You see, when I was seven, my mum left me. She left me in the care of a, a strict dad who had his own issues with shame and guilt. And he was so guilty of the fact that his seven-year-old got sexually abused that he took his guilt out on me. He took his shame out on me. He couldn't handle it. So what did he do? He got angry and took it out on me instead of firing the perpetrator. And so here I was left by my mother. She left me for 12, 18 months in the care of my dad. She should have been there to protect me. So I made a vow. I'm never going to love or trust a woman 
because women leave you. Where was she? You see, my mind was unable to distinguish or work out the truth, and that is my mum was forcibly removed and put in a mental home. And, uh, and uh, she was actually dragged out kicking and screaming. But to me, she'd left, to, to my child's mind, I believe the lie that she left me. She left me vulnerable. She didn't protect me. But when I heard that, all of a sudden I understood that I was not a nutter. I understood that I was not a mental case. I understood that I simply was living under the power of a lie. The lie that you cannot trust women. You cannot allow a woman into your emotional life or you're going to get hurt. It was a lie. And so many times these lies are subconscious, but you know that something's not right. Well, here in the Christian Family Centre churches, you can find healing through prayer. You can find wholeness through prayer. You can find the lie and have it broken through Jesus Christ. So, make an appointment with someone in the counselling team where in prayer, God is asked to heal your emotional scars, those painful memories, those things that hurt, those open wounds in your heart. See, God doesn't remove the memory though, but he miraculously removes the pain and the trauma of that memory. And he also removes the lies and accusations and a guilt associated with those memories. Some years after that event, I was still aware that there was still some residue in my life from the physical beatings and abuse. I was still aware that I was carrying some pain from that, that you know, and it, it was coming out in my life in various ways. And um, so I booked in to, with one of our counsellors into prayer healing and and she just prayed, Jesus, oh, she asked me, first of all, to ask Jesus, uh, to tell Jesus that he had permission to take me back uh, to the memory. And um, so I gave permission. I said, Jesus, I, I give you permission to take me back there and uh, show me what happened in, in greater detail. And um, as I prayed that prayer, I saw my dad coming into the outside bathroom. You see, Wally had given me a, a little toy boat, a little blue and white steamer, and I filled up the bath and I was floating my steamer and, <clears throat> and here I see, you know, Jesus take me back. And, and uh, my dad came into the outside bathroom and saw the steamer and he said where did you get that and I just froze up I, I knew what was coming and um, he just said Wally gave it to you didn't he and I didn't reply so he dragged me out of the laundry and pulled off his belt and began whipping me and as he was whipping my back Jesus showed me a vision of him, Jesus, coming and laying over me and taking the whipping. And it was like, he said, I've taken the hurt now. I've taken the pain. You will experience it no more. And I came out wonderfully, wonderfully healed and uh, even more healed than I was before. And um, Jesus is our healer. Of course, we also need to fill our mind with God's word. And Pastor Bill gave this out last week. It's from Neil Anderson's book. And it's entitled, Who I Am in Christ. 
and I s saturated my mind in this and uh, they are scriptures that relate to I am accepted in Christ, I am secure in Christ <clears throat> and I am significant in Christ and uh, we have here a list of scriptures that tell us who we are <clears throat> that oppose the lies that have been planted in our minds in our souls and the first one is I am God's child John 1 12 I am Christ's friend I've been justified I am a saint I've been adopted I, I am free forever from condemnation and, and God's word is there the scripture reference is there to look up <coughs> So the more you fill your mind with God's word, with the Bible, the more you build your life on truth and the more you replace the lies. You fill your mind with the Bible, memorising and studying and reading and then you need to believe that. You need to believe the truth. You need to you know, really base your life on God's word, what God has said about you, the truth. Believe it. And what is the truth about you? Let's read Ephesians 1 verse 4. For those who have received Jesus Christ as the Lord and Saviour, we read Ephesians 1 verse 4. Through what Christ would do for us. Through what Christ would do for us. That's the key. It's not through what we can do for Christ. It's not through what we do. It's what he has done. Through what Christ would do for us. God decided to make us holy in his eyes without a single fault. We stand before him covered with his love. What, would, what has Christ done for us? He has taken the punishment for our sins. We should have been whipped. We deserve to be punished. But he stood over us. He stood in the way. He stood before, between us and the punishment for our sin. He stood between us and and the abuse of abusers. He declares that we stand before him innocent and pure and covered with his love. We are covered over. He is our substitute. He substituted himself. The sinless one substituted himself for our sin. So we are without a single fault as we trust in Jesus Christ. So that's how God sees you once you step across the line and give your life to Christ. God sees you without a single fault. He takes everything you've ever done wrong. The guilt, the regrets, the shame, the hurts. He erases it and he says, we're going to start over. God sees you without a single fault. Why? Because of what Christ's love has done for you. That's the good news. You know, psychologists have proven over and over again that the way you see yourself, in other words, your self-esteem, your self-worth, your self-concept, is largely determined by what you think the most important person in your life thinks about you. So the way you see yourself tends to be based on what you think the most important person in your life thinks about you. Now, for many of us, the most important, for many people, and in fact, for most people, the most important person in their life is their dad and their mum. And if their dad and their mum have criticised them, put them down, told them they were stupid, they were worthless, well, that's how they see themselves. You see, I'm not what I think I am. I am what I think you think I am. And that's how many people live their lives, trying to impress other people so they feel good about themselves. I'm not what I think I am, I, I am what I think you think I am. And if, the most if you think the most important person in your life thinks that you're worthless and no good, then you're going to live like that. So why are so many young people so destructive today? Why are they so self-destructive? Because they think that the most important people in their life think that they are worthless and no good. So that's how they live. So I want to suggest that you make Jesus Christ 
the most important person in your life because he's going to tell you the truth. And here it is. This is the truth. So are you going to listen to the lies that your teachers said in school, that your parents said, that your uncles and aunties, that your friends said, that your ex-wife or ex-husband said? Or are you going to listen to what God says, the truth? That you're Christ's friends, that you're justified, you're a saint, you've been adopted as God's child, you're complete in Christ, you're free from condemnation. That you're significant, you are the salt and light of the earth, that uh, you are God's temple, that you are God's co-worker, that you're God's workmanship, that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That's what I'm going to believe. So the Bible says that when you're in Christ, you are valuable, you are acceptable, you're lovable, you're unique, you're irreplaceable, you're special, and you're usable. That's what God says you are. That is the truth. So who are you going to believe? Someone who ridiculed you or put you down or what God says about you? It's really your choice. You have to replace old tapes with God's truth. And it takes a process, but you need to start on it. And we have these, these all over the house, you know. At different times we've had them on the toilet door. At different times we've had them on the fridge. You know, at different times we've had them on the, in the study. You know, they're all over the place. And um, Do you want to start over? You can. It's possible. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. When someone becomes a Christian, he's a brand new person inside. He's not the same anymore. A new life has begun. That's what happens. And God says to you, let me heal the emotional scars. Let me put new tapes in the tape recorder. There are some here that may be an inquirer this morning. Uh, You've never invited Christ into your heart. You're inquiring, you're investigating, you want to find out who Jesus is and whether he can help you change your life, whether he can heal you. Maybe you're here today on an exploratory discovery type trip and today something has gelled with your heart and you've heard through what God says in his word that you can be healed. Step across the line. Invite Jesus Christ into your heart. Let Jesus heal you and help you. Reveal your hurt. Release those who have offended you. Replace the old tapes with new truth. God gives you the opportunity, just as he gave me, for a new life. And so could I encourage you to take hold of courage today and take Christ's hand and take those steps of recovery. You can begin today. Would you join with me in prayer? As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I'd like to say to you in Jesus' name, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what the scar. It doesn't matter what the sin. It doesn't matter how you fell or how badly you fell. There's healing for your life today. There is salvation, forgiveness for your life today. If today you have sensed Jesus Christ knocking on the door of your heart and calling you to him, to himself, to be healed, to be made whole, to be loved by him, to have him hold your hand through your life for the rest of your life. Would you pray this prayer after me in your mind? Pray this in your mind after me. Jesus Christ, I realize that you see and you feel all the pain in my heart, the hurt and the resentment and the anger and guilt and the fear and insecurities. 
Jesus, you see it all. I desperately need your healing. I have hidden wounds. I have emotional scars. Help me to admit the things that have hurt me. Help me to admit these things to myself and to you and to a trusted counsellor or pastor the things that I've been ashamed of. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing me to a safe place called the Christian Family Centre Church where I can do this. Today, I want to begin the healing process by asking you, Jesus Christ, to come into my life. I need your help to stop focusing on getting even and to start focusing on getting well. So Jesus, I'm going to need your help and the help of others to release those who have hurt me and replace the old tapes with your wonderful truths. Jesus, I look forward to the day that I am so healed that I am able to help others the way you're going to help me. I need your help today. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.